Hey everybody, Russ here, back with another short video. This time I want to talk just very briefly about the different genetic mechanisms that are involved in ADHD, since there seems to be a lot of, I think, confusion out there about what might be going on here. So uh, this field is rapidly changing. I think it's one of the fastest moving areas of research in the field of ADHD right now. Lots of new discoveries, lots of potential for new discoveries might help eventually with diagnosis using genetic testing. We're not there yet. Don't get genetic testing. It's not reliable, but in the future, maybe. Also, possibilities for new drug development when we discover new genes and the pathways in the brain that they may be affecting, we might be able to then look for other possible medications that affect those pathways. So lots of excitement in this field. Let's take a look at the mechanisms that have been examined to date. First of all, we originally thought way back 40, 50 years ago that maybe ADHD was kind of like a single gene variant that caused the disorder. You know, kind of like Tay-Sachs disease, where if you get a particular recessive gene, uh, and maybe you get it in two copies, you might wind up with a terrible brain development. Uh, at this point, we have no evidence that a single gene determines ADHD the way a single gene might determine eye color or other physical properties. Uh, the second possibility, talked about by somebody in Australia on a YouTube lecture, is that you can get ADHD if you get two copies of an ADHD risk gene known as homozygosity. I'm aware of no evidence that supports that particular idea. A third possibility is that ADHD arises from broken chromosomes. So in the transmission of the chromosomes from parent to child or during very early child fetal development, there are breakages that take place in chromosomes and these cause gross aberrations in the expression of those chromosomes. Uh, at this point, we don't have any evidence that ADHD arises from such rare and often lethal uh, situations. What about getting an extra chromosome, as we might see in trisomy 21 or other rare genetic cases? Well, that's possible. I mean, some of those very rare genetic abnormalities do lead to a heightened risk for ADHD in people with those conditions. But they're so rare and they affect such a small percentage of the population that they're not going to be an adequate explanation for ADHD as we see it in the general population. But that doesn't mean it doesn't operate in some rare cases. Uh, let me just back up here. Hold on. There we go. All right, next up is where we are right now, and that is that ADHD is a complex trait, very much like intelligence. Complex traits are determined by multiple genes, with each gene contributing a very small effect to that overall complex trait, which means there's going to be many genes involved in determining that trait. If the trait that underlies ADHD is executive functioning and self-regulation, as I believe it to be, that's a very complex trait involving probably seven or more different mental or cognitive components that work together to create executive functioning and self-control. So uh, as with intelligence, there's gonna be many, many genes involved here. And if enough of those have the ADHD variant associated with them, so a slightly different version of the gene is what I mean by a variant than what we would see in the typical population. It's gonna contribute a small effect, so it's gonna take many of these genetic ADHD variants to lead to an expression of ADHD. Uh, now to date, at least 12 and up to 22 of these genetic sites have been identified in genome-wide association studies. There's likely to be many more involved. Uh, we believe that there's anywhere from 30 to 100 genes involved in the trait of intelligence. Most likely, uh, we could see that many involved in ADHD. We just don't know, but it's gonna be a lot of different genes. More importantly, these genes may affect different pathways of the brain. So five of them might be involved with dopamine. Five of them might be involved with the uh, alpha-2 ports. There may be others involved with the um, uh, other neurotransmitters, such as serotonin or maybe norepinephrine. So uh, there are different pathways here that we're talking about, and different genes may 
string together to build a pathway. Disruption in those genes could affect that pathway. What does that mean? Lots of heterogeneity. There may be different genetic expressions within the brains for people with ADHD, some having one network involved, some having many, uh, so that we have to be prepared here for quite a wide array of genetic effects within the brain. But right now, people are studying these multiple gene variants. Uh, studies are being done where we add up the number of these genes that people have, ADHD risk genes called a polygenic risk score, and then we examine whether those can predict things about people with higher risk scores versus lower risk scores. For instance, we've seen that higher risk scores predict obesity, higher risk scores predict lower educational attainment, lower intelligence, greater risk for adolescent pregnancy, and so on. So these polygenic risk scores are proving useful. Even then, however, they explain only about four or five percent of the variation in ADHD to date, which is why we say there's gonna be a lot more genes involved in ADHD than we have seen so far. But very promising area of research here on multiple genes determining a complex trait. Now, that said, let me just back up here, keep advancing these slides. Uh, I wanna talk about a somewhat different mechanism, and that is that how are these genetic variants being transmitted to the offspring to cause ADHD. Well, one obvious role that you all know about is inheritance. The parents have the genetic variants. They then transmit this to their offspring through eggs and sperm, and the child gets the risk for ADHD so transmitted. So a lot of evidence for inheritance involved in ADHD. If a parent has the disorder, the child is eight times more likely to have the disorder than families that don't have ADHD in the parents. So very strong genetic transmission. However, it has more recently been shown that about 10% of ADHD and even about 25% of autism spectrum may be due to de novo or new mutations. These mutations arise in the sperm and egg of the parent but don't otherwise exist in the parent's DNA. If you did a blood test or a cheek swab, you wouldn't see these mutations, but if you looked at the eggs and the sperm, they're occurring there. So these new mutations can arise, they can affect the genes that cause ADHD, just like they do for autism, and they are transmitted to the child. It's also possible that the mutation arises in the implanted egg just as it is beginning to differentiate, and so it could be there as well. But it has been estimated that more of these genetic mutations are occurring in fathers than mothers because the genetic material of the male, their gametes, their sperm, is more externally exposed, the testicles, for instance. And that leaves them more open to trauma, uh, temperature, other adverse effects, radiation, what have you, uh, than would be found in females whose gametes or eggs are contained internally. The other reason that it might not affect females so much is that a female has all of her eggs she's going to have in her lifetime present at birth. So there's very little to mutate there. The eggs have already been created. Whereas in the male, they are producing millions of sperm all the time. And as a result, if a mutation arises, it's going to affect subsequent copying of those genes during these millions of reproductions of sperm. So a lot more opportunity for this to affect males than females, which is why we see that where de novo mutations have occurred, they are much more likely to have come from the father than the mother. Now, why are these mutations occurring so much more now? Because people are waiting to have children. And if you have your children at age 30 versus age 20, you are eight times more likely to have these mutations in your eggs and sperm, particularly the sperm of men. And of course, if you wait even later, the risk is even higher. And that's because the longer you wait, the more you are being exposed to environmental mutagens, things that can mutate your genes, such as radiation, toxins, poisons in the environment, trauma, and so on. I don't mean emotion, I mean physical trauma to your uh, egg and sperm production uh, tissues so that you can have uh, ADHD arising over time as a result of parents waiting 
to have their children. And so it's believed that that's probably what's driving this rise in cases of de novo mutation. So there's another possible genetic mechanism for ADHD explaining why we may see ADHD or autism spectrum in an offspring and it's not in the rest of the family. It's likely that that child may have a de novo mutation case. It's also possible, however, that the child has simply acquired ADHD through some other mechanism. Don't forget that about 20 to 30% or more of ADHD is not genetic. It's due to some adverse event affecting brain development, most often prenatally, but sometimes postnatally as well. Next up, there are gene by environment interactions where a gene for ADHD, a genetic variant, may exist and increase the odds of ADHD by, say, two or threefold. Now, if the parent drinks alcohol during pregnancy, that alcohol may affect the expression of that gene and magnify the risk of ADHD from the presence of that gene by eight times, according to one study that looked at alcohol, that is maternal alcohol consumption, by gene interactions. So just another possibility here that you could be magnifying the risk for ADHD by exposure to certain environmental toxins or other events, most often prenatally. There can also be gene-by-gene -gene interactions. So you have this gene for ADHD. It's going to increase risk very slightly. But if that gene is in the presence of another genetic variant for ADHD or several such variants, then the effect of those genes become much more magnified than it would be in, had you just had that single genetic variant. In other words, the expression of genes is partly dependent on what is often called the genetic or cell ecology in which that gene finds itself. If it finds itself with other ADHD risk genes, the effect could be magnified. Now, at the moment, this is hypothetical because people haven't had a chance to study it. What little evidence there is isn't suggesting very much gene by gene interaction, what is often called um, this sort of interactive process, but more additive. That is, with each new ADHD gene you get, it increases the risk for ADHD a little bit more, then a little more as you start adding up these genetic variants. But there could be some gene by gene interactions going on here. Finally, and most interesting, is the field of epigenetics. Epigenetics, which is just at its very beginnings in ADHD, is the study of how certain flags or markers get placed on a gene, which doesn't change the gene's architecture, but does affect whether or not it is expressed, where it is expressed, that is, in what cells of the body. Is it going to be in muscle? Is it going to be in blood? Is it going to be in brain? And may determine, to some extent, how it interacts with other genes. But at this point, it looks like it mainly affects the expression and the location of the expression in a particular gene. Let's not forget that all of your genes are contained in all of the cells of your body, but only some are being activated in those cells to determine that tissue type. Certain genes are only activated in brain, creating brain development. Others are activated in your skin, in your lung, in your heart, and helping to determine that structure as well. So what's happening here is that because of exposure to certain things in the environment, such as biohazards, alcohol, tobacco smoke, and so on, these genes may come to be marked with these flags. And these flags are affecting expression. Now, it's also been suggested, particularly animal research, that these methylated flags, these epigenetic markers, can be transmitted to offspring and therefore affect the expression of the gene in the offspring, not just in the person, the, the parent with the methylated flag. So uh, there is the possibility of inheritance of ADHD through an epigenetic mechanism rather than a genetic mechanism. Now that's a possibility. It's been shown to occur in other research on humans, in other research on animals. It has 
only now being studied in ADHD in its infancy. The findings are very small but promising. And so let's not overstate the case. I find in people talking about ADHD, they assume that epigenetics has been demonstrated beyond a shadow of a doubt in this disorder. I particularly hear this when I'm talking about uh, trauma, emotional trauma in ADHD, and that it could be producing epigenetic effects. That is way past what we really know about ADHD and epigenetics. So uh, let's just go through where we are right now. I'm going to be summarizing a recent review in 2022 by Cecil and uh, Nig, and I'll give you the uh, citation for that. You can look it up and read it in the th thumbnail sketch. Uh, but basically, they're saying that there have been five population-wide, epigenome-wide association studies looking across all genes, four methylated flags in people with ADHD, and only one study has found any such methylation. So, not a great start there, but let's also understand that these population studies had relatively smaller samples. It may be that with much larger samples, the effects of the methylated genes of epigenetics will come out, but at this time, it is not being found in most studies. Now, there are some clinical studies, however, that have compared ADHD groups to non-ADHD groups, and they have found certain genes, not always reliably, but probably the most reliable, as you see here, is the VIPR2 gene, which creates a neuropeptide that is expressed throughout the brain. This gene may be methylated in ADHD, if it is, it appears to be less methylated in males with ADHD, more in girls with ADHD, suggesting strong sex differences in this epigenetic effect. So here's a gene with some promise that it may, when it is methylated, influence to some small degree the expression of ADHD, or at least be associated with the diagnosis of ADHD. But again, very premature at this point. Let's not run out and start, you know, screaming down the hallways that we have found an epigenetic effect here, but very promising early research. Another gene that seems to have some promise, as you see here, is the ST3, GAL3 gene. Uh, it appears to be linked to the timing of ADHD. So when it is methylated, at birth, it predicts future risk for ADHD. However, when we look at children with ADHD, it is no longer found to be associated with risk either currently or future risk, suggesting that it's the timing of the, of the gene where its methylated expression might affect risk for ADHD. So that's just going to create even more difficulty studying this, uh, but also even more scientific, I think, curiosity here about different genes turning on and off at different times in development to affect ADHD, and if they're methylated, it may affect the timing of their expression. So again, very, very early. I don't want to overstate what's going on here. These are just the initial glimmerings of epigenetic effects in ADHD, but a very exciting area of future research going on here. So if you're interested, stay tuned. Uh, I'll show you the review over here. Just hang on. Uh, and it is this review here by Charlotte Cecil and my friend Joel Nig at Oregon Health Sciences Center. It's over in the journal Molecular Diagnosis and Therapy. Uh, and as I said, it was published just about a year ago. Uh, and again, I'll put the link over in the thumbnail sketch in case you want to do a deep dive into the weeds, some great graphics in here about the etiology of ADHD, about epigenetics and so on. So um, have a look over there if you really want to get into the details on epigenetics. Okay, everybody, I've taken enough of your time. I need to get off to the gym. That's why I'm just the way I am. I got to work off some of those Christmas pounds. So I'll see you on the next video. Thank you again for tuning in and watching this channel. Thanks again for being a subscriber. I really appreciate it. Lots of great replies showing up on these videos. Wish I could get to answering them all, but I can't. Just way, way too many now, but I try to answer a few as time permits. Thanks, everybody. Be well, and if I don't see you before the new year, happy new year to all of you. Take care.